Hello, it's Ian Dale with you. Uh, I've got a very special guest with me for this hour of the programme. Uh, it's one of my music idols. I'm trying not to sound too stalkery. It's Sir Cliff Richard. Cliff, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, of course, the reason that we've invited you to talk to us today is because you've got this new album out, yes. Christmas with Cliff. That's the first Christmas album you've done for 19 years. Why, why the gap? I don't know. It's other th I only thought about it now because the record company asked me to do a Christmas album this year. I never sat down and thought, oh, when does the last one? But thinking about it now, the, th the fact that Christmas does come around every year, the danger is that you might get into that groove or you're the one that comes out at Christmas and it might be boring. So in, in a way, it's probably a good thing to have left the gap. And uh, when the record company said they'd like me to do a Christmas album, they actually sent me a page of, I don't know, 150 songs, classic ones, and I didn't know there were that many to choose from. I just said to them, OK, I'll choose 10 and if I can find some new ones, would that be okay? And they said, okay. I found three new ones, I sent it to them, and they said, fabulous. So it's a 13-track album, and if I may mention Stormy, his has only got Storm 11. Stormzy. Stormzy. <laughs> well, I don't really know him, you know. I've never heard of him until I came for this promotion tour. Is that right? Well, because I live in Barbados. I've missed so much that goes on on radio and TV. Yeah, but Stormzy, his album's only got 11 tracks. Oh, so Mine's one got already? I've got 13. Now, you, you, on release, the album came in at number two in the charts, which I know from when we've talked before, you are a bit of a chart obsessive, aren't you? I am, yeah. That's the way my life was, though. Nowadays, you know, now you... I came in at number two in the, in the sort of charts that covers Spotify and all those things where my fans who probably don't know what a iPad's like, but um, I came in at number one, on the record, the, the physical record chart, and that's what makes me happy. That's what I am. I don't make MP3 things. And <laughs> my engineer once told me some years back saying, you know, people don't realize, but MP3 is not anywhere near as good quality as a CD. No, it isn't. So I'm happy to be number two. I'd rather be number one, you know, but I keep saying to people, look, at least I'm going up. I'm up to two. Stormzy is one. There's only one way for him to go. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you'd be saying that if you're coming at number one. I know. But of course, there is still a bit of time till Christmas, so the extra listeners to this programme could make the difference. Well, there's always that. Or there is always that. And trying to think back that most of the time when you release a Christmas record at the end of November, it's it's like you two or three weeks to four weeks to Christmas, and, and it's the third week that it they really get, yeah. oh, I might miss it, so let's go and get from a grand or mum or whoever. And... Uh, Yes, I mean, yeah, I could sell more records before Christmas. And, and um, Stormzy actually said he wanted to be one for Christmas. So if he is, then I won't be. But I still hope that I sell more real records than him. Do you, do you still, and when you're listening to music, do you still listen on vinyl, CD, or have you got, do you listen through I, earpods? I listen AirPods, because all my friends seem to go onto the internet and they get, they get music played, but it's not their choice. You know, I mean, I listen to their choices, and I like two or three of the songs, and some of them are rap and all the other things that I, I have no interest in. So I have um, a CD player in Barbados, but it only holds six CDs. So I leave it in there for about four days, and it plays everything. Mm. You know, what do you call it? Shuffle? Sh shuffle. shuffle? Yeah. And then suddenly I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get... And then I go and get Pink Floyd or you know, something that I like and put another six in. My phone here, I've got 42,000 songs, <laughs> including 1,500 of yours, and I, and I put them on shuffle the whole time, so oh, I, I oh, never yeah. know what's going to come up. So did you go through and, and buy each track? Well, a lot of the ones I'd already oh, was got it an on, album? on CD, so I just converted them. Ah. But all the new ones I, I do buy, I hate to tell you, I do buy on MP3. So well, I, I contributed to this week's chart position. The funny thing is, the, 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 the album, the artist I've bought most is me. Because I, <laughs> I, I suddenly found that I don't have, I don't have green light. Or really? every face tells a story. Or How can that be? I don't know how it is. Because... They may still be in a box somewhere because I've moved so many times and now I live in, in Barbados. They may be, as a, as a album, be somewhere else in a storeroom. But anyway, I, I thought, I'm going to get some of my old albums. So I went down. And of course, you're not, you're not buying it over the counter. So people don't really know it's you that's buying your own records. And uh, 
So I've done that. So I've got about half a dozen of my albums. And because I did that, I started listening to them. And there are songs and tracks on them that I don't think the public will remember. But they're funky rock and roll. They are not Living Doll, Summer Holiday. Mm -hmm which I'll be remembered for, and I'm happy about that. But there is stuff there that really is what I would like to have been remembered for. So well, I'm asking Warner if they would listen to the tracks that I chose and say, do you think it's worthwhile doing this? And call the album something like Clifford to set free. This is what I'd like to have done and had hits with. I think you should do an album of Cliff remixes. Oh, that's, of these tracks, only about four need to be remixed, though. But, but I mean, sort of done in a different style and sort of... Well, like... they did one of Wired for Sound, but I was so disappointed. It was typically of that kind of danceable stuff. Yeah. But all they ever did was uh, put Wired for Sound and then... None of the lyrics at all. Wired for <laughs> Sound all the way through. So I didn't, I didn't find that very imaginative. But yeah, I could... It would be interesting to say, get a guy that does that stuff and say, and choose the songs with him. And said, "Okay, can you move? But don't remove the lyrics." Mm. They, well, but, which, which period of your career? Uh, forget the commercial success. Which period of your career do you did you find most rewarding from an artistic point of view? The the the, the series of albums that you thought, well, you know what, that they are absolutely first class. Well, the series of albums produced by Alan Tarney. And uh, also there was a couple that Terry Britton, who, who wrote... Alan Tarney wrote me, Some People, and We Don't Talk Anymore. Terry wrote Devil Woman and a whole bunch of stuff. Mm. And he and I produced an album together in Paris once, which, ha which in the end had We Don't Talk Anymore on it. So that period for me was when I, I grew into something else and he, they stretched my voice a lot more. I used a, a section of my voice that even now, I, you know, I'm 82 now. I'm just grateful that I can sing anything. <laughs> but um, there's, there's a certain, that, that, like the tracks I'm trying to choose for this, hopefully, a, 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 an album that people have not heard before. Um, I'm, just, I'm just, that's what's got this voice that I used to use. It's kind of very high. Falsetto, well, wasn't it? And, and so, I, I want people to hear that. I'd love younger people to give us a chance, you know. We're not, unless you're actually on the internet. It's like Kate Bush had a huge success with that running up the, uh, yeah. running up the wall. And all because she was played every day on a, on a, on a I think it was a Netflix movie. It was, yeah. So every day, every time that started, it was her song. And of course, she had all this great interest. So... I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know that... I think the record company are now pushing me on the internet in America, aren't they? So they're, they've been willing to try. And, of course, in America, they don't really know me. So they don't know how old I am. It doesn't matter. If they can just hear these songs, they'll think I'm a new 20-year-old or something. I was, about, woman I was in my 30s one, then, they? though. Devil Woman got to number one in America, didn't it? So, I mean, is that, is that the only song that they, they would really No, I, I got two... Uh, Elton released two of my records because EMI America, quote, were not interested or excited by Cliff Richard material. So they dumped everything that always had been hits everywhere else and didn't release it. Elton wanted to take Devil Woman and We Don't Talk Anymore, and they both got into the top ten. So uh, I have a lot to thank him for. Now, let, let's talk about Christmas. How, how has your Christmas changed over the years? Well, it's changed massively because, uh, you know, one of my sisters doesn't... She's a Jehovah's Witness, and, you know, we've always loved each other regardless of what we believe, and they don't celebrate Christmas. So my sister, Joan, used to come with her children, and we'd have a fabulous Christmas at, 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 in Weybridge and Surrey. And then... The two children suddenly got boyfriends and girlfriends. And they suddenly said, oh, we're going to go to Fred's mum and dad and Jean's mum and dad. And so my sister rang me up in tears saying, they're not coming with us. I said, look, Christmas is not just all about children. It's about adults too. Just come. And fortunately, my manager has sent me a fantastic gift that year. It had all sorts of shrimps and prawns and, and what do you put in shells that I don't like? Oysters. <laughs> I can't stand them raw, but no, I, I, I got a recipe in Australia called Oyster Skillpatrick. So I, I did that for her. It's oyster, you shuck the oyster, throw out all the salt water, cover it with spring onions, a bit of bacon, uh, soya sauce, under the grill for a couple of minutes, bring it out, Parmesan cheese, another minute, and you serve it with a 
a glass of... On Christmas Day? Christmas Eve, actually. But <laughs> she had that, and with a glass of champagne, she was in heaven. She said, oh, it's wonderful being here. And then, of course, we had the normal turkey and stuff. What, what do you remember from your childhood Christmases? Childhood? Well... The early childhood, I was in India, of yep. course, and there's one year particularly, I think I may have been three or maybe four, I got a dream gift for me. It was a tricycle. And I remember we, we used to use, my parents used to use Christmas to get in touch with their brothers and sisters, my aunts and uncles and cousins and things, and we had this huge hallway in the apartment that my my father didn't rent it, but his company rented it for him. And, and so the table was spread right down this checkered floor aunts and uncles, and I rode around it, bumping into chairs and things like that, and my father made me go out of the room to cycle it somewhere else. But I remember the excitement of having a tricycle. Mm. And it was it was terrific. And of course, again, you know, as a child, I came to England when I was seven. I had my eighth birthday here, and I saw my first fall of snow in Carshelton in Surrey. I was staying, we were staying with my mother's mother, and, and after that, we went and got it. We had managed to get a council house. But we always had a, a great Christmas. My father was a great one for taking that crepe paper, rolling it around, and hanging it from the light in the middle right to where every section of the wall. So we were covered in this, it was cheap crepe paper, but it looked magical to me. So I've, I've had that Christmas feeling all the way along. I, like, I really enjoy Christmas. And I was saying to somebody in another interview that... They said, well, what about people that don't believe what you believe? I said, do you have to believe in it to like it? You don't have to. I said, I read books. I read things I, can... I don't believe them, but I enjoy reading it. So I said, really, Christmas is just a matter of enjoying yourself. If you don't have any faith in God or whatever, does it matter? I just said that when I lived in Weybridge in Surrey, the, the, the road out of my estate took me to a T-junction. Now, during the year, I could hardly ever get out. I used to pull out slowly, 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 and then someone would stop. Christmas time, whoop, and people would call you over. No, please, come on in front of me. <laughs> so there's something good that comes out of Christmas, and it affects all of us, and we needn't w worry about whether we believe it or not. Yes, I believe in it all, but you don't have to to enjoy Christmas. How will you be spending Christmas this year? A, a bunch of friends have invited me to Florida, to, well, I, was, I thought I might go to Florida anyway, but they've actually really pushed me a little bit. I, I said, well, I've got to work, and I'll be back on the, I'm going back on the 11th of December, and I'll be there for till Christmas. And there's a bunch of people that said, we'd like you to join us. So I said, absolutely. So it'll be good. They're very, very sociable people out there. And what I like about them, though, Ian, is that having gone there for the first time some five or six, no, maybe more than that, eight or nine years ago, I met a lot of these people, and they just said, oh, hi, nice to meet you, Cliff, and that was it. They had no idea who I was. Mm. Usually on the third or fourth meeting with them, we'd sit talking, and uh, I'd say, oh, what do you do for a living? And they say, oh, well, we do d design or whatever it is. And they said, what do you do? And I said, <laughs> um, you know my name, don't you? And they said, yeah. I said, tell me, Cliff Richard. I said, that's right, Google me. And the next time I meet them, they came and had their f hands up to their mouth going, oh, my God. Because when you, when you Google an individual like myself, suddenly you realise how many hundreds of pages of things there are, mm. all sorts of YouTube things they discovered. But the thing that I'm telling you is that they liked me before they knew I was a showbiz person. And that, over the years, that must have been quite difficult to weed out the people who wanted to know you for you yeah. as opposed to the people who wanted to know you for what they could get out of you. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that came to a head, particularly in America. Uh, but and in a way, sometimes, once you become known in your own country, there's, and in fact, somebody told me, I think I, think I read it somewhere, that uh, when I was on my 40th birthday... I read somewhere they said that there's nobody over the age of 10 who hasn't heard of Cliff Richard. And I thought, I kept thinking, yeah, that'd probably be true. Under the age of 10, they're not interested in anything, really. So I thought, that, so I'm, I am known. And that becomes the, the only danger is that then that you have to be aware that you ha I'm not very good to recognise people that might be wanting to use me in some mm. way. But, uh, but you can certainly recognise them when, they when, you, when they're, they're overtly friendly. And so uh, it's no longer a problem for me because I like being recognised, but in America, I like being not recognised. I've got to tell you, I went into a... Do you know the States at all? Yeah. There's a great supermarket called Publix. And so 
Um, and one of the reasons why I go there is because they've got an alcohol section <laughs> in another hall. But um, I went there and I, I walked in and this guy was, it's pandemic time, and he gave me something to rub my, my hands. And he looked at me and I said, where's the, um, where are the vegetables? That's the first time I'd been. He said, well, got far right. He said, do I know you? I said, I don't think so. Anyway, I went and got my vegetables and I came back. And, uh, he was still there and he gave me more of this stuff on my hands. And he said, look, what's your name? And I said, Cliff Richard. He said, I thought so, Keith Richards. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I'm much better than him. <laughs> and I, oh, then I, I said, Google me. And I left him again, came back, he, and he had Googled me. And he said, I knew you were famous, he said, because I can smell celebrity from 50 paces. <laughs> and I thought he smells celebrity. I must have been wearing some nice shorts and shirts. I obviously don't get that as often as you, but I do get it sometimes. And people say, um, I, I, I've seen you on the television, haven't I? And I say, you might have. Just leave them guessing. <laughs> yes. But you go out film, don't you? Like this, There's a camera. Wait, this is all being filmed. Yeah, this but the, when around. you do your show, yeah. it's also filmed, isn't it? It, it? We used to be a radio station, you know, but it, it's now all multimedia. All multi <laughs> so we go out on every single Yeah, but you're likely to get recognised by the people that listen to you at night. Well, I often get recognised by my voice, which you must do as well. Well, it, I've only discovered that, though, uh, when I went somewhere with a mask on. And, uh, you do that often? <laughs> well, I thought this was going to be good for me. Anyway, the first person I meet says, Oh, Cliff, I mean, how did you know me? She said, I, I, I got it from your voice. I yeah. must have been talking to whoever was, I was with. She heard the vo my voice and recognised me. But the mask is pretty good, especially if you pull it up and under your glasses. Oh, I, I, oh you mean a COVID mask? COVID like, mask. I was, I was, I was oh, yeah, no, 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 a COVID mask. mask or something. <laughs> and, of course, wearing them with glasses, the glasses kept fogging up. Yeah. So what somebody said to me was, pull it right up high, put your glasses down on top of the, the, the edge of the top part of the mask, and then pull the bottom end out, and would you believe it, no mist on the glasses. So I kind of do that whenever I can. <laughs> Why, why didn't you include some of the old Christmas songs on this album as well, sort of save you as well? Well, save only because. Day, you mean old ones of mine? Yeah. Well, it's been done. That 19 years ago, having that Christmas album, I think it was called Together, Together at Christmas. Yeah. Because it had a song on there, We Should Be Together at Christmas. And um, that album was then released about two or three years later with something else like, it's, it's, like, like Mistletoe and Wine, maybe, or something like that, and they would take a couple of the other hits I had, put it on that album, and take a couple of tracks off. And they've done that, I think, two or three times. So, Do you have it, any say in that? I mean, when the record company wants to do that, do you personally no, if, get any say I, in that? If I really felt strongly about it, I'd say it, and, and I think they would honour my feelings, but n normally they've got, they know how to sell things. So that album has ap appeared in the top 20 two or three times because they did that. And so now what's going to happen, I suppose it's possible that in a few years' time they might say, let's, get, let's do another Christmas thing and we'll put, you know, the new ones on it. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe you could do a Christmas duet next year with Stormzy. Now there's an well, idea. Well, why not? Apparently he sings. He does. Yeah. Actually quite well. Is it? Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to try and listen to it. But the new album, I've got, funny, if I, they put a new album in my hand and, uh, and I, I had it in an interview and I said, this is, this is it, his, his record. I said, all I know is that I shouldn't be here. He should be complete, competing with other contemporary artists and here he is having to get past me and he did get past me. For the, but, but I did win the real record chart. That's what thrills me. I like that because that's what I, I never think of making a record for, for you know, on, on the internet because, because people have to listen to it with headsets on. I want to have an album that you can play loud and then when you've got a party, you play it louder still and it's, it's fun, more fun that way. Um, I don't know if you saw the story earlier this week from the ONS who uh, showed statistics from the census that showed that Britain is a much less Christian country than it was 10 years ago. I think 59% of people identified as Christians 10 years ago. It's now down to 46%. Um, does that matter? I don't think so. We can't, you can't force people to believe what you believe just because they've come from Middle East. You know, if, if they're in fact w worthy of being here and do working well and study here, well, a lot of people come, young people come to study because they get great education. So I think to myself, well, in a way, if we want world peace, it may not start the way we want it to finish. 
And so therefore we need to be available to people and we should never be judgmental. Uh, so it doesn't bother me if someone wants to be something else, it's up to them. I only know what I believe and I wouldn't change it for anything. But if they come, if they come to our country, I'm sure, I, I don't know whether I can say this, but I'm sure people from the Middle East would probably enjoy what happens, might even have a Christmas tree on the front lawn, I don't mm. know. But in the end, for me, Christmas surpasses almost anything because the basis of it is love. It, that's, it, it's, every time I have read bits of the Bible, whether it's Jesus' time or, or God talking to the Jews, it was always predominantly love. You have to love people. In America, they seem to have lost that a little bit, and that's coming from Christians. Mm. And, you know, you, 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 there's been a big controversy about Jewish people being downed now by a famous person. And I'm thinking, and, and a lot of conservative Christians feel similarly about foreigners, and I'm thinking, if they're Christians, haven't they recognized that Jesus only said, love everybody, love your neighbor, and love everybody? And yet somehow they can not love. It's interesting you say that, because when I do phone-ins on, on sort of social issues where Christianity might have held a sort of fairly traditional view at, at one point, and often I come back with saying, well, don't you think Jesus wouldn't agree with what you're trying to tell me, that this, this is a sin, because it doesn't say anything, it's a sin in the Bible, so surely you have to think what Jesus would want. Exactly. Uh, it, it's, it, and again, when you, when you take Jesus' life, and in spe in, especially his death, the whole says, why did he give himself to be hung on that cross? Because he loved humans. And he did it for humanity. So again, it, I know that people can't believe that. Maybe it's because they don't trust themselves enough in what they believe. But for me, it was like an eye-opener when I read it. And I, you know, there's a phrase that helped me to become a Christian. It was uh, Jesus. There's this famous picture of Jesus with a lantern outside a door. And in, in the phrase in the Bible, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock and I'll come in to anybody that welcomes me in, and I will sup with him or her. And when I read that, I thought, oh my, that's incredible, that, that that should be offered to you. So it helped me to make my mind up that this is the way it is. Now, have I ever heard the voice of God? No. I felt it when I've read things. You know, in the end, it, when, 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 I, when Christians say God spoke to them, it, it, he, they speak... They speak, uh, they're spoken to because of what Jesus said and what the Old Testament, how God said, what he said about the world and how we should behave. And, and so therefore, it's a misnomer sometimes to say, I heard the voice of God, but you, I really mean I've heard his message. Now, when we reach the end of the year, we look back on a year, and obviously the last couple of years have been fairly traumatic for all the reasons that, that we know. And we always look at look at who we've lost over the year, and you've lost a very close friend this year, Olivia Newton John, um, yes. who, when I interviewed her about eight years ago, she got a cookery book out bizarrely. So obviously we spent about two seconds talking about that, and then then her career, and she was exactly how I imagined she would be, the Olivia Newton John that everyone sort of loved. Yeah, um, that that must have been a very difficult time for you. It was, and it was shocking for me, and that's a surprising thing for me to say because all of us as friends of hers, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that we could call close friendship with her, and uh, we knew she had cancer. Mm. She's been fighting it for 30 years. And, I mean, only three weeks before she died, we were on the phone together. We phoned each other quite regularly. And, you know, I, I said, hi, it's Cliff. And she said, oh, good day, darling, how are you? And and when I was asked, well, how was she? I said, look, judging by her voice, she's absolutely up and still fighting. And so I I put the phone down and we talked about her and I said, well, I, I've got a feeling she'll be here another 10 years. This this cash is not going to get her. And three weeks later, I got the message. And the, mm. it was a shock to me only because I'd been talking to her and I'd thinking to myself, she sounds fantastic. And, and Tanya called me and said, oh, there's lots of TV and people want you to say something. And I said, look, I don't think I can look into a camera and talk about Olivia, not at this moment. So I wrote something down and we put it on my Facebook. I paid a tribute to her in, in words, in other words. And um, 
and we had a lovely photograph of us hugging on stage when she came to sing Happy Birthday with me for my, I think, 75th birthday or something like that. And so it, it, was just, it got me out of trouble. I was able to say what I felt, but I couldn't say it verbally. Mm. But this time now, when my TV show comes out on the 17th of December, I decided that I would do Suddenly, which is a big duet we had together, and her voice is on the track, and I sing it live. Oh wow! And I think this fantastic. It was very. I just I saw the, the rough cut. How of did it. you get to the end of that? It was. It, it, I was. I had to, it tears in my eyes listening to it and watching her write. And sometimes it's we, we. I looked at her and she's singing this way, and it's almost as though we were standing there together. But it's um, it was my my chance to pay a tribute to her, and and I did it. So, just remind everyone how you first knew her because it wasn't. Wasn't she in a backing band for your Saturday yes. night show on the BBC back in the early 70s? She, um, she was with a girl called Pat Farrer, who wasn't Pat Farrer when she came over with Olivia because she had not married John Farrer, who became Olivia's writer and producer. And most of the big hits she had, he, he wrote. But in the end, what, it, what happened was Pat and Olivia were a singing duo. They won a competition in Australia that said... The, the prize is we're going to fly you to London and you'll get a, uh, a chance to sing on a big TV show. And I saw that show. It was the Des O'Connor show. He, he had one of the biggest mm. running shows. And they were good. They danced together and everything. But it was Pat and Olivia. And then I found out that my manager knew her and he managed started to manage the two of them. And nothing was happening, so I said, well, I'm going on tour. Why don't they come and be my backing singers? And they did. They came to all over Europe with me. They came to Japan with me. And then Olivia made If Not For You, that Bob Dylan song. And, of course, we shared the same manager. I was thrilled she'd made a record. And I, I had my TV series. The first one was in the early 70s. And that's when I met her. That's where she was in my backing group. And that's when I said, why don't you come on my show and sing your record? It will be the first public performance. So I can honestly say that I was the first person to introduce Olivia Newton-John to the world because she came on my show first. Basically, you made her. Hmm? You made her. Not quite. <laughs> there was no doubt in my mind. First of all, she was gorgeous looking yeah. and gifted. And of course, once she sang, she had a hit here. And then she got offers to go to the States. And she said, you know, what do you think? Should I go? I said, Olivia, it's where records sell. This is what you have to go. So by that stage, Pat and Johnny got married. They all went off to uh, America. And, you know, our loss was their game. But we kept in touch. We still made records. When I sang for her on the film, and I, we did Suddenly, sometimes, twice that's happened. She called me and she said, Oh, good, I can how are you, darling? And then she said, I, I, I'd like to ask a favor. And I'm thinking, She's got a song or something. And then she said, I'm doing this Xanadu film called Xanadu. And she said, my co-star doesn't sing, and I'm going, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm punching the air thinking to myself, and sure enough, she said, John and I would like you to uh, sing the duet with me. So I, I don't think I even asked to hear it because Olivia and John have what we say are very sensitive ears. They can hear what's potentially going to be a hit. So I went over there, and the funny thing is it was in a garage. The engineer's garage was the only place that was available so glamorous. we recorded in the garage. <laughs> well, it was all curtained off and everything, with carpet on the floor. And the only thing that bothered us was every, every five or ten minutes a lorry would go by. But someone was on, on looking out the window all the time and says, hold the tape. And once it had gone, we'd continue. You see, we all think of recording studio, studios being incredibly glamorous, lots of flunkies sort of <laughs> mopping your brow and all the rest of it. And you have to wait for a lorry. <laughs> I know. But in the end, you see, it didn't... The silence was good, but when you have a lorry, it shakes everything too. So that, that's what held us up a little bit. But in the end, when I, when I heard the tape, and then I, then I thought, it's fantastic. And you know why it was fantastic? Because the duets between male and female is sometimes very difficult to get the right key so that it's good for both of us. And I said, well, I don't know about you, Olivia, but this is perfectly in my key. And she said, it's perfectly in mine. And the only time I had to go to falsetto was one note high up in the middle eight of it. Uh, that was it. Otherwise, we sang naturally. And I've sung it on stage with um, 
I had another female singer, and, and Olivia was not obviously here, so we sang it together a couple of times. Well, during a tour, many times. But it's a song that is just, I think, a forever classic, mm. absolutely classic. Now, you're doing another tour next year. Um, you're doing six dates at the Apollo and Hammersmith and yes. Glasgow and Blackpool, I think, as well. Um, how... I, I saw you in the Albert Hall. Was it last year or earlier this year? I can't uh, remember. Uh, last year. Last and, year I was at Albert Hall. And I took a friend of mine, who's an MP's wife, and who's a bit of a fan, and we, was, we were quite sort of up in the gods, and we both agreed that you could easily have done that show in your much younger years. And you're thinking, how does he do that at the age of 80? Because, I mean, you, you are very, very animated on the stage. And yeah. ha have your shows changed over the years in terms of what you feel that you can do in terms of the choreography? Yeah, we, it's changed drastically because the, when I came into my 70s, I was very conscious of the fact that you... And I've always believed that rock and roll, you can't just stand and or sit and sing it. You have to have movement. And there was a time when I used to have, what, eight or ten dancers on stage. I would be choreographed. I would do... And I always say to my... The choreographer was an Australian. I said... I'll try and do anything you like, but I like to sing live. Yeah. So that if you could give me some steps with them and some steps back, everybody says, I was dancing. But it's given me a chance to stop and take yeah, breath. Yeah. So that's what I did. But as I got older now, for instance, the last tour that you saw, what I tried to do, look, I'm 82, and I don't want to let the rock and roll world down by being somebody that's trying to pretend to be 18. So I thought... I'll just sidle across to the other side of the stage and do a quick hip shake <laughs> and then sidle back. And then I did. It was a, a bit more than that. Well, I did a couple of things with the two dance, two, two of my backing vocalists are both theatrically trained, so they can play an instrument, they can dance, they can sing, yeah. they can act. And I always knew that because, you know, sometimes when you go towards your band member and look at them, they kind of get embarrassed and sort of look away. These guys, I look at them and they look straight back at me. It's fantastic. It's like acting. And we did that. The one I liked best on that last tour was a thing called Marmaduke. Yes. That was and, and one of the dancers choreographed it lightly. I said, let's just do something in it. And uh, it, it was fantastic to do it. And it's, it's one of these songs that I'm talking to, I'm going to be talking to the record company about. It's hidden away on a song called Stronger. Mm. But it wasn't on Stronger originally. It's only available on that version on you, on uh, iTunes. And, and I... I I played stronger. Then I thought, wait a minute, track 12's in it. Now it's 13, 14, 15, 16. There were about 18 tracks on this album when there were only 12 originally, and the last one was Marmaduke. I thought, oh, I've forgotten all about this track. It's so rock and roll. It's so heavy and guitar riffs. And, that's, and in fact, when I did um, Desert Island Discs, I kind of said, they, they asked me at the end, you know, are you happy with things? I said, oh, yeah. I just have one thing... Um, I, I, I wished I could be remembered for something else as well. Yes, I, I can't, how can I grumble? I am going to be remembered for Living Doll, Summer Holiday, The Young Ones, all number one hits. But I said, can you play me Joe Bonamassa, High Water Everywhere? I mean, they played it for me. And it's really this guy. Dun, 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 high Water Everywhere! Really screaming out. And I said, when it was over, I said, I'd like to be remembered for something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's just one of those things. I, I, I'm no fool. I don't think if you'd said to me, OK, you can be remembered like that, you go back, start again. I, I like being successful. And with the help of a lot of people, I have been. You know, nobody does it on their own. Have you been to see the ABBA Voyage show? No, I haven't. Because all about it. it's interesting that they're all in their 70s and they felt that they couldn't perform live. So they spent millions creating these holograms and this yep. amazing show where you go and you genuinely believe it's them. I mean, you're, something you happens in your brain. But you believe it's them as they were. It, it, yeah, from 1977. And it is the most amazing thing. And I just wonder whether we'll ever see a cliff hologram. Well, yeah, but I wouldn't want to put myself back into time and look 18 anymore. I'd rather be as I am now and do, and do the filming of whatever it is and then next year look like I am now. I'm not pretending to be 
30 years younger, mm. this is what it, and, and with the with the whole thing of help of technology, I could go back to doing things like Stronger where I was a dancing maniac, which I can't really do anymore. I mean, I'd fall over if I tried. <laughs> so that's the way, if, if, if it, the opportunity came, I would say, look, this is what I would like. I'd like to people to think, oh my God, I, I just seen him looking like that on stage at the Albert Hall. Only he's dancing more, but it'll still be fake. So even with them, it's a fake thing, but I can't wait to see it because, I mean, they were a bit like the Beatles in that they had, their finger was on a pulse yeah. of everything they made, I, everybody loved. Yeah. It was a fantastic time. Now, Cliff, the last time we talked, we, we talked, you'd been in the House of Lords talking about the FAIR campaign. Yes. Falsely accused individuals for reform. Now, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about sort of all the history of that. We've done that, done that before, but... Do you feel that that's all kind of put behind you now, that you're in a happy place? Oh, yes. I mean, I feel that I'm, I'm past it all. But I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to forget it, you know. I still have memories of what it was like to be in bed, unable to sleep, waking up with my pulses pumping like mad, thinking I'm going to die of a heart attack. Mm. So I, I'll never forget that. But I think the main thing was, my lawyers had said to me when I was in Portugal on a phone call, they said... Um, we've we've never had we've never had a client who has a hundred percent public support. Now I was tempted to say who have we worked with, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. And I thought, and that's what's helped me really. What's helped me get past it is that I know that mostly everybody did never they never believed that I could do that. Mm. I don't have a background. It wasn't like Jimmy Savile who had a background, and many other people who have a background. I never had that background. And if anybody thinks you can get away with that for 50 years, you're crazy. You could never get away. The press would have got, got hold of me immediately. So I just had to get past the initial, the initial upset. And then when everything seemed to balance out, I felt much more comfortable. And now I feel I'm just back to where I was. But, you know, you know I, I don't think you know, I'll ever forget those four years. Well, let's finish off with a couple of quick fire questions. What's the best Christmas present you've ever had? Well, the first one I really remember that I loved was a tricycle in India. But the other one was something simple, you know. I'd, I'd, I'd passed my driver's test and everything, so it must have been a couple of years after that. And a fan, who's no longer with us actually, sent me a little package and I opened it up and it was a key ring. And when, so I put the keys on it and then I pressed the thing, I pressed it and it, this light came on. That to me was fantastic. So many times I was five minutes trying to get into the car because you cannot see where the key ring goes and where the key goes. And so to me, that was one of the most, it was one of the best. And it was it positively good for me because I could actually get into the car in the dark, just had a little light. So that, that one I remember very well. Uh, and what is your favorite Christmas song? It's now firmly become Mary, Did You Know? Because it's, it's actually about the Christmas birth. And, and the guy that wrote it, apparently, I can't remember his name. It's probably on the, on the CD, of course. But he, he said he'd written it over a period of three years in the early, early 80s. And he, take, he took that long because he wanted to be theologically correct and everything works. So when you listen to the lyrics, it's like... You saying, Mary, did you know that he was going to walk on water? Did you know that he would save your sons and daughters? Did you know that he walked where angels trod? And I'm thinking when I sang it, it was so, so moving. So th to me, I think that's from, going to be my favourite. But, you know, that's because the essence of it is perfect. And I did my best to sing it. The, the version I really enjoyed and I learnt from was Kenny Rogers. He did a version, but I remember I said to you, I took a one high note that had to do a falsetto in, in, in Olivia's duet. In Mary, Did You Know, there was one note at the end, and they said, sing it in full voice. And I said, I, I can just about make it. And then I tried it once. I just went, ah, with falsetto. And the guy said, we'll keep that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the whole thing was so beautiful to sing. But you know... I like listening to Jingle Bell Rock and Rocking Around the Christmas Tree. It's, they're, they're all great songs. And, and Joy to the World. Oh, you haven't played it today, but maybe you'll play it some other time. My, the German guy that, that did the arrangement, I felt when I listened to it for the first time, 
that I was sitting in a theatre because this little tinkle, tinkle goes in and then there's a little bit of strings and it suddenly swoops into, oh, joy to the world. It made my, it got, I'm getting goose pimples now. Mm. It's, it's just a fantastic arrangement of that song. I can't, I don't think I'll ever better claim that I've made the best version. But I've made a good version of it, and that's all you can do off with these classics. Because usually you, you will remember, like for me, Elvis singing Blue Christmas, to me that's the iconic version. I think mine's a good version, but it's just different. And as I've said a couple of times now, I just hope Elvis fans uh, will like it that I haven't destroyed it for them. I don't think I, I, don't think I did. Well, Cliff, we have to end there. I know everyone listening would want to wish you a happy Christmas. Let me do so as well. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you. It's my pleasure, absolute pleasure to be with you. It always is. And thanks for all your support through the horrible years and the good ones too. Thank you very much. Thank you.